Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. We're in our Christmas mode. Nobody's wearing jingle bells, but we do have a beautiful tree coming out of Mr. Risto's head, and, uh, and it's a good time. It's actually gotten to be a very nice set right now. So um, I realized that the, during the taping of our first show, I neglected to introduce my fellow elves. <laughs> elves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Claus. Over here. <laughs> Oh my. Oh dear. Where do oh, I go elf, with that? Elf, <laughs> elf, elf, yeah. elf yeah. Okay. Elf Cal. Elf Tom. <laughs> Snoozy. Here at the North Pole. Dopey. Dopey. Yeah. And I'm just playing grumpy. So we're we're doing fine. Dopey. We're we're mixing our metaphors. Yes. We're mixing elves, elves and, and dwarfs. You, there you go. So they just said the stories are melding together. So we don't have to start this segment over. We're going to continue to move forward. Um, there's actually fairly serious business before the state. Um, remarkably, in my opinion, Governor Doyle is calling a special session of the legislature to convene uh, December 11th. Cal, I asked you to kind of brief us on what it's all about. And um, Well, the governor has finally called a special session on campaign financing, and that is something after... He and the legislature being beat up by Common Cause and other public interest groups for the last uh, year or so, um, because many people ran after the Jensen and Koala fiascos of uh, the last session on reform. And everybody was seeming to say, well, when is the proof coming in the pudding here? And finally, the governor has uh, put forth a special session. Um, the bill is basically uh, the Ellis bill that uh, was been around for a number of years, and uh, it does several things. One, it increases, it, it, its emphasis is public financing, basically. Uh, we have had a public financing law in, in place, uh, God, when did we debate that in the legislature? Probably in the 1970s, I think 76, I even chaired the elections committee at that time and took a lot of heat for it. And uh, it was a dollar check off voluntarily on your income tax. And basically, it became so ineffective financially that candidates didn't take public financing. And so uh, they turned to special interests. And we know that from Supreme Court races and governor's races and legislative races, <coughs> that special interest money and shaking down special interests has become almost a full-time profession for some of these candidates and groups. And so the call for public financing rejuvenation has been one that Common Cause particularly has championed. And the bill that's before the special session, uh, the heart of it is to beef up the funding and make it uh, viable so that candidates now will be able to plug back in. And it will raise the dollar check off to $5 or more. I think there's flexibility as what you can put into the fund. Um, the big debate, of course, will be between the conservative Republican viewpoint, where many of the Republicans in, in assembly particularly have said, we don't believe in public financing. Uh, this is something that's unnecessary. Private interests, uh, if they want to give money to candidates, that's fine. So there is that conservative viewpoint who will not take up this bill, don't want to take up this bill at all. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in, in the assembly. Then there's another group of, us, uh, of conservatives who say, we're willing to accept some type of public financing, but it's going to have to come as an additional tax on the person who checks it off or a reduction in their refund. Right now, the present, the bill that's been put forth and the way public financing has operated over the years is that you check it off, but it comes out of the general fund. It doesn't come like off. the federal system. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason it's done that is that we're not trying to punish anybody or make it onerous on anybody to say we ought to be financing these things without campaigns without special interest. Uh, the other thing that they're looking at is Supreme Court has ruled that without public financing, you can't have limits. The new limits will be much substantially increased. Uh, just looking at the common cause uh, uh, summary, $4 million for governor, $700,000 for attorney general, $150,000 limit for state senate, $75,000 for state assembly. The old limits, I think, were $35,000 for the, for the assembly and $50,000, I think, for, for the uh, senate. So you can see substantial increases. Um, it tries in some way to get around the court ruling about uh, that have legitimized and said there's nothing wrong with the independent expenditures by saying that if you do get barraged as a candidate by the special interest, 
you will get additional money I know. from That's the fund, yeah. up to three times what your spending limit is. So, in other words, 150,000 bucks limit for a state senator, three times that 40, 450,000 could come your way if WMC or Right to Life or WEAC or whoever the special interest group comes on, on the scene and starts maligning mm -hmm. your character and spending a lot of money in your district. Um, I wish this would be, there would be a way we could get around the Supreme Court ruling because I think these independent expenditures are ones where we don't know where the money's coming from. It usually comes in last minute. It's a real game at, in character assassination and I, and I really think there ought to be new ways of doing it. I don't know this is a solution, but it is being suggested as, as one way. Uh, there's also a provision in the special session bill saying that groups that want to participate in the public uh, arena uh, can give additional contributions. In other words, WMC or unions or whoever want to participate in funding their democracy, they can contribute to the campaign financing law and make additional contributions, which would then be monies available to candidates. So, All uh, candidates, though. Yes, yes. So it, I think it's a package that uh, has a lot of merit. There's more to it. I'm not going to spend all the program uh, going over the, the details. But it is something that has been sort of uh, talked about for the last couple of years since, as I said, the scandals in Madison. And it's good to see that now something's on the front burner. I think it'll pass the Senate, the state Senate, because the Democrats do control it and they're going to be loyal to the governor. Um, but I think the assembly is going to be, even though there's only a three vote margin in this, by Republicans in the assembly, there is that split amongst Republicans about public financing in general, as well as how it is financed. And so the, that may indeed make this bill only a watered down version of it when it comes out of the assembly and then going to a conference committee, how do you resolve that? So, but I, th I, I commend the governor uh, for doing this because if it f goes down in flames, he, will, he can simply say, I did put forth, the culprits are such and such, uh, these groups, they, they killed it, not me. I'm for it, and he has done his work in, mm -hmm. in initiating the, the legislation. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a big package. It's certainly long overdue, and I, I particularly like the provision about if you are attacked by independent expenditure groups that, that you can get additional money to fight back. I was the treasurer for a, an assembly candidate a couple different times who took public financing because mm -hmm. He really couldn't raise money any other way. <laughs> and uh, the rules were complex. The reporting requirements, understandably, mm -hmm. were, were thorough, as they should be when you're getting public money. Um, but it really, uh, and in this particular candidate's case, it was much more money than he would have ever had in any other, uh, any other respect. But if you had a really viable candidate, I mean, it's just a noose around your neck. Yeah. You take this money and you're done. See, I, I this is ripe for fun and games. I'm going to be, I'm attacked. I need more money. And then, or if I need some more money, I send somebody out to attack me. I, you know, I, you know, I don't let people know that, but I send somebody out to attack me and say, I'm being attacked. I need more money. I mean, it's ripe for all kinds of abuses, at least that part of it where you say the request for more money, three times more money. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, my retort, uh, my response would be that. Uh, the system has been broken. That is all it is wrought with games today. Yep, um, I agree. <laughs> all, all, all these candidates do, and from the Supreme Court to the governor to the legislature, is shake down special interest groups. And one of the provisions in the bill is at least there's no fundraising during the budget, which is the ultimate shakedown yeah. because that is a, a oh, big. Oh, I did not know that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, now um, that's an important piece. Yeah, yes, no, it that's is. an important piece. I agree with that. It yeah, sounds like that it will be eventually compromised. I mean, do you think any action will happen at all? Well, when the special session is called, um, this is that's the legislature meets because the governor says you be there at ten o'clock on such and such mm -hmm. a date, and that bill is introduced, and the legislature must dispose of it, uh, and they can ship it off to committee and kill it, but they have to something have to. has to action with the bill has to be taken, and if the assembly decides to can it someplace in some committee, that's their decision, and they have made a decision to kill the bill. So the governor has uh, gotten, they need to take some action. Mm -hmm. Because when they're in session, the, the chief clerk in each house reads the bill, says this is the hour, this is the session, uh, and somebody's got to do something about what with this bill. 
it's been just introduced. Has anybody heard, or do we have any sense of what reactions are among legislators? Well, I heard the, 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 the leadership in the assembly uh, echoed the long-held position of the Republican caucus that they have trouble with the public financing aspect of it. Okay. And like I said, uh, that is the caveat for some people who don't like public financing as well as those who don't want it to be a, uh, without an additional tax on the person who wants to participate. Maybe a, a, a compromise <clears throat> would be at least to, to try a, a vibrant and realistic public financing uh, structure for Supreme Court races. Uh, I mean, I think that we have seen the uh, justice system, which should remain above political pandering and, and, and politics and, and all those other kinds of things, really be demeaned in these, in these terrible, terrible Supreme Court campaigns. And uh, I mean, the Justice Ziegler is still, I mean, the sky is still falling in on her. Um, uh, uh, Justice Butler, who's running for re-election, disclosed a $500 contribution, I think, from one of the attorneys who appeared in front of him. Did it a little belatedly, at least according to the account that I read. And um, uh, I mean, it can get to the point, you could have, and it has come close to this, where issues come before the court, where the justices have all received contributions in one shape or another yeah, from the parties them. before them. <clears throat> well, and that is not, and that's not cause for automatic disqualification. I mean, it, it, it almost can't be. And we, we do need to remember that people running for judicial offices may not, cannot, and do not ask for money personally. Yeah, school choice. It's if you got a, uh, a judge who probably favors school choice versus a judge, possible Supreme Court, who might not we act maybe contribute they don't want school choice so well, they happened? contribute to the this judge this judge sure. can't vote on it he has to recuse himself right. mm -hmm. and then the judge who got money for because they kind of favor school choice they or they have to recuse themselves i mean where do you stop yeah yeah well and where you stop is you say at least in this particular part of the political spectrum we can afford to have public financing we can afford to have campaign limits and we can afford to keep this system as pure as possible um, and out of the really nasty political arena. I mean, there, there just don't seem to be the limits that there used to be. And, and that is carrying over into these judicial races. The race between Chief Justice Abrahamson and Sharon Rose, you may not remember, I sure do, it was real, real, real unpleasant. Um, the, the race between Clifford and, and, um, and Ziegler was very, very unpleasant. Um, and I'm trying to think, um, there have been a couple in between. Justice Wilcox got a huge amount of improper support from charter school organizations outside the state. And I'm sure he did not have any personal knowledge of, of these various violations and so forth, but that was very tough for him and tough for the court. This has got to stop. And even if it's in a compromised position where you don't have this kind of thing going, where you, where you at least would have some sort of, of rules and financing just, just, and just Supreme Court races. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking for the sun, the moon, and the stars, just a Supreme Court race. I don't know. To me, it makes sense. Um, I think it's going to be um, in the, the law that this proposal that Cal's talking about. If people don't check off uh, the one dollar, two dollars, five dollars, and, and as I understand it, maybe I read it wrong in the summary too, Cal. People actually will have an opportunity to to check off on a partisan basis. Is that, in other words, I can put five dollars to the Democratic side or five dollars to the Republican side. But that the point being is that if we don't, if if people don't do that, and I know we didn't get, we don't have time here to go into this public integrity endowment, which is a way for people, organizations, as you were talking about, to put more money into the pot. If that money isn't sufficient to fund this, then it is going to come out of general revenues. And I think that's what's going to be difficult for Joe Blow to get their head around, I think, is that for the first time, tax dollars are going to be financing private well, politicians. And that's something we're not used to. And right. it's going to take. When the monies were insufficient, yeah. the candidates were prorated. Right. Right. I mean, the right. pot just got. 
my hapless candidate. <laughs> I guess got my, a little tiny amount of money. Yeah. He was supposed to get thirty-seven thousand, and yeah. I think he got seventeen. Yeah. I think that's going to so be a real things. mental obstacle for lots of folks is to really understand that if uh, you know you if you're unhappy with the current arrangement, and it seems like large people people are in the general sense that they don't feel politicians are being uh, responsive to them and their needs and, and in their lives and connecting with average folks, whatever that might mean. Um, the, the, and the bridge will cross that river to accepting the fact that my hard-earned tax dollars are going to be, part of them anyway, are going to be going not only to universities and schools and bridges and highways, but to pay for elections. That's going to be a, mm -hmm. a travel for a lot of folks, I think, yeah. a real journey for them. And I, I, that's why I think ultimately There'll be a discussion and a debate, but I don't know how far or how much this bill is going to be passed. Yeah. Uh, but I, th I do think the proper beginning is to at least say that, at least for judges' elections, because even if there is an impropriety, even if judges don't really vote or decide cases based upon their campaign contributions, a lot of people think they are. And I think there is a certain double standard when you start looking at the way, because Ziegler's been down this road, I think the bar for her has been laid up a little higher than, say, Justice Wilcox, who nobody really much, there wasn't much yelling and complaining about Wilcox. And then you got all these kind of questions about when do you recuse yourself and when don't you recuse yourself. Um, and I think that's really very, very tough. And, and so you get all sorts of bizarre sorts of standards and it's, it's going to cause real trouble. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make the court look like the legislature or the governor for that matter. And we don't um, want that to happen. No. At least not with our legal system, which is uh, a pretty swell system. Justice Ziegler is now disclosing all campaign contributions. I think that's an excellent step. Yep. Not that those things are not accessible, but to take the step of, of, of actually letting the public know in a proactive way who you're getting your money from is, um, one, I think was a smart PR step for her, but two, just I, I, from an ethical perspective, I think, it's, I think it's an excellent idea and I give her credit for trying to salvage something out of this this very difficult time for her. And didn't we, I think we talked in one show that she's going to work, she had to contribute so much money to her own campaign that essentially she will work six out of ten years just to come even to the, yeah. <laughs> the, the job won't start paying until she's well into the second half of her term. So hmm, things have got to change as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it'll be interesting. Well, you never get your money back from the presidency. So. There you go. <laughs> well, what some candidates have done, though, is, is they give the money to their campaign, but it's an understanding it's a loan. Right. And then they, through the budget years and whatever, they shake down all these special interest groups to raise their 60000 and whatever they lent the campaign, and the check is written back to them to reimburse them Absolutely. for it. Absolutely. Which is something that smells, too. Yeah. yeah. Although I think candidates who make loans always do hope that the one way or another that they'll get, get repaid, but uh, in any event. Um, we are now at the juncture where the cable bill, the infamous cable bill, has been passed in both houses of the legislature, soon to be signed by the governor. We're going to have a really nice farewell show here. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we be as, as the, the, the young folks on the Titanic and stand on the... <laughs> on the bow of the ship as it slowly sinks down. I don't know if that will necessarily happen, but uh, that's been a very interesting process, kind of fast-tracked, and uh, it'll, it'll remain to be seen how, how all of this plays out. And well, I think it was a good victory for the proponents of the, of the bill, which uh, were companies that are not the cable franchised uh, people in place now. They're the AT&Ts of the world who want to enter the arena. Uh, there were substantial contributions made, and I think they bought the goodwill in the legislature, and the bill passed. I think from people I have talked to with fewer amendments than they thought would occur. Um, and as, as a result, uh, they were somewhat surprised at the fact that the legislature amended the bill so little, even after very heavily being lobbied by people who are, for example, in the community television area. and. Uh, other people who had concerns about uh, the way the f way the f well the way the existing operations are and whether they ought to be continued. I didn't get a sense that the local municipalities, the mayors and and common councils across the state, 
Um, you didn't hear their voice. Maybe it was there. Maybe the lobbying was going on down in Madison because they stand to lose a, a, a flow of money uh, that budgets, their budgets rely on. So I would think that mayors and common, and common councils across the, the state would have really been a much more vocal, much more visible um, uh, discussant in this, in, in this debate. I, I was really surprised about that. And I don't think most people understand that. Yeah, I may save a couple of bucks here in my, my cable bill or whatever it might be, uh, but what's going to happen to my property taxes when those funds now flow someplace other than to the local communities as they negotiate the local contracts with whoever's going to be providing their services? For example, the money that comes to the city of Sheboygan is about $400,000, as I understand yeah. it, from cable fees, about a third of which comes to produce this show and the many other fine shows that are uh, on, uh, on TV8 um, and other, uh, other cable stations. Um, so 200 some thousand dollars will be lost to, to the city in terms of revenues depending on how all of this flows and uh, so that, uh, mm -hmm. that will be interesting. I did check the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign's website because they have fully, they have all the financial records on, online sorted by industry uh, and so you could see that the candidates and legislators rather who were um, in favor of the bill received about six times more money from um, AT&T associated lobbyists than, than, um, than legislators who did not and so there was really quite a disparity there so I think this probably was one of the better bills that that money could pay for I, I, I don't know but uh, it'll be interesting to see, number one, just how it works and if it does deliver all the promises that have been made, and then second, how it affects this station and this wonderful TV show. I mean, we're going to be nominated for an Emmy one of these days, <laughs> I keep thinking, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah, uh, best I mean, comedy. <laughs> the, the, yes, the best disjointed... Best reality <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, best disjointed reality comedy show on the... Uh, <laughs> in the universe, but uh, in any event. Um, well, it really will be interesting to see what will happen, because I think a lot of people do um, watch, at least some of the time, shows like this, or they watch their local school boards, or they watch their local common councils and their uh, county board meetings, and they get a, at least a general sense of what is going yeah. on. And when that, if, it, if this plays out, where cable companies can provide services without having to worry about these types of things, it will be interesting to see how well involved and informed people are going to be about right. local government and even for that matter state government because there's some, been some discussion about putting with state government on, on uh, local access cable channels also so people can see uh, the Senate and Assembly uh, at work just like we watch C-SPAN on our national channels. And that's terribly exciting. Well, <laughs> It can be particularly when we're making speeches and we know the camera is on us. Um, uh, uh, Scott Jensen, uh, the DA in uh, Dane County, has picked himself up, brushed himself off, and he's going to start all over again, uh, he says, with a new trial for, for Mr. Jensen. Uh, uh, it is my understanding that the um, Attorney General decided not to appeal, appeal that. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think it will be I interesting to see, how that, to see how that plays out. I wonder if Chuck Kuala is saying, gee, maybe I should have been a you know, played yeah. it a little bit more. I don't know. I mean, there is talk now that rather than going through a, a trial that could be much longer because that judge at that time, any time Jensen's uh, defense and Jensen himself would say, well, everybody's doing it. I would like to bring in people who also have done this to show that I was not the only perpetrator here. Uh, the judge says that's not relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. Shut them up, you know, and sort of maybe compress the to trial. If they can bring in, you know, truckloads of people who said, yeah, I did the same thing. I shook down people. I did it on state time, and I used state phones and all those type of things. Is this going to be a long trial? And now is the DA going to say, you know, I got, I got to run a, I got the Dane County DA's office. Should I plea bargain now with uh, mm -hmm. Jensen? And all of a sudden, uh, the deal that's it's wrought is a good one for Jensen. I don't know. Can but you imagine getting that subpoena, having the, the process server at the door? Hi, you've been invited to testify at this trial to the illegal activity that you engaged in, <laughs> just appeals, like Mr. Jensen. But to, uh, unless I'm, mis I'm misunderstood, and please disabuse me if I'm wrong, the, the appeals, the appellate courts 
overturning of that or ordering a new trial was based upon the judge's instructions to the jury being erroneous. Mm -hmm. So that judge, in theory, could run the very same trial, make the same kind of rulings along the things that you're suggesting, Cal, as long as he just or she changes her instructions to the jury at the end. I mean, that was the offending piece there, right? Well, and part of it was that the instructions were in, in the operation of the trial that he could not he was always silenced and when he said I'd like to bring in someone else who, mm -hmm. who did this or I think I think Jensen wasn't wasn't he corrected by the judge when he would start going off on these things say well so-and-so down the hall was making the calls at the same time I was and other with the idea that I wasn't the only guy I was part of the whole was part of the whole atmosphere of how things ran in state government at, at that time and the judge would say well that's not relevant you can't say that you know and they're I think mm -hmm. part right. of the appeal court judge says, well, you can't shut him up for that. He could raise, say that if he wants to. And sure, and typically the jury instructions, particularly in a big case like this, you would have thought that those would have been, there's always a jury instruction conference at the end of the trial, but you have to imagine that there was a whole lot of, uh, of work on those issues prior to the trial. And um, something called a motion in limine, which if granted, um, prohibits one party from saying or presenting a theory of the case or whatever. So the jury instructions, I think, are pretty tied to the testimony that's allowed. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, yeah. and um, because you well, get, it's an element of the case, and, and, and you know, it's a part. Jury instruction tells you what elements the, the district attorney has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's my sense the judge all along, and this was, you know, just this way wrong. But, I, I mean... Typically, in a big case, that's how that would get played out. So, I don't know what the plea deal was. Jensen was convicted of three felonies, I guess, and a misdemeanor. So, mm -hmm. um, maybe not. Maybe just something a, a little less serious. I can't I, remember what Koala was convicted of or what he pled to. I if, can't remember. Either. But I mean, he spent nine months in jail. Yes. Yeah. So, I and mean, and he was a convicted felon, I believe. I, I think yeah. he lost his li his license. Exactly. Well, I, I think it'll be an interesting defense strategy to say, well, everybody else was doing these things that look deeply suspicious and corrupt, so let me off. Yeah. I, I, mean, I know juries are going to do what juries are going to do, <laughs> and, yeah. and you just don't know at any given time. Well, it's that like, was this. I think be the whole intent of the way yeah. that we wanted to get into this. But I don't know, that might play well with the jury. You're saying yeah. all these politicians are all corrupt, you know? They're all the dirty. Poxen and all their yeah. house, you know? And yeah, well, I, if, yes, if, I, if, I, better not like, be, I better not be in that jury because I'll say guilty, now let's bring on the next it's one. It's just yeah. like a oh. speeder. Everybody speeds, but you get, get caught. Get, yeah. Yeah. You get yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would certainly advise any client of mine who is being subpoenaed to plead the Fifth Amendment, but in any event, we have very little time left. Let's celebrate um, Madison and the state of Wisconsin, again, being in the forefront of stem cell research, uh, new stem cells, viable cells being d developed from human skin. We get away from the embryo debate, which was certainly was not a good thing for the state in terms of advancing its, its research and economic interests in, in stem cells. But um, again, I think Wisconsin needs to celebrate, number one, being a leader, Number two, it needs to capitalize from an economic perspective, uh, sort of the Silicon Valley of the, the stem cell valley, valley of, of, of the country. Um, we need to keep it here in Wisconsin, I think. And, and one thing we could do, a little promotion here, that the Wisconsin Academy, of which we're both involved, the Sciences, Arts, and Letters, will be sponsoring one of the UW researchers speaking at Mead Library in May of 08 to talk about stem cells. So I'm sure we'll get right from the horse's mouth uh, what research gains they have made. Excellent, a Excellent fine way idea. to stop. We hear from the Donahue Group, send our wishes for a happy holiday season. And uh, I was gonna make everybody sing, but I guess we won't do that. Thanks and we'll Merry see you in the new year. Christmas.